What is up guys? It's your friendly neighborhood web word fanatic and today we just hit 900 subscribers which is totally insane. I'm so thankful to each and every one of you guys who always watch, comment, like, subscribe, all that stuff. So uh, to show my appreciation, we are going to be doing a big one today. Uh, I'll be ranking every single villain in Marvel Champions in terms of their difficulty uh, for expert mode only and for true solo. So uh, let's go ahead and just jump in it. Let's get started here with Absorbing Man. So uh, Absorbing Man is notorious for being a pretty easy villain and he came in the uh, Rise of the Red Skull. I actually don't find him to be the most easy on Expert, so I'm going to go ahead and just put him here in the C tier. And I think that, so C tier is definitely leaning towards more easy, and then uh, D tier is like it's very difficult to lose. Um, so for Absorbing Man, he's definitely not a difficult villain, but on Expert mode, uh, it can get a little difficult because his stats are a little bit higher. And then uh, you do, so he has these delay counters. So every single turn he's adding one, and then uh, his encounter cards will do more effects based on the uh, based on if there's more or less de delay counters. So if there's more delay counters, the effects would be a little bit worse. And then he'll gain traits based on the environments. So he might have the ice, stone, metal, or wood trait. And the encounter cards will have different effects based on whatever trait he has. Um, it's not that bad of uh, detrimental effects on the encounter cards. So he's definitely not difficult. But you do want to kind of gun him down because of those delay counters slowly building up. But since his hit points are very low, he is very easy to gun down. So he is a very easy villain. Um, just not, in my opinion, not like a complete pushover type of villain. Okay, so next we have the Collector 2. This is Escape the Museum. So this is one of my favorite scenarios. Uh, so with the Collector 2, this scenario is a little bit different. You cannot defeat him by killing him, right? So after you uh, get his hit points down to zero, he'll flip over to his... Uh, other side where he has infinite health, his, his wounded side, I mean. And uh, whenever you do that, you can remove threat from the main scheme. He has three main schemes, and basically all you want to do is remove all the threat from the first main scheme, which will advance the second main scheme. So you're basically in the museum and you find the Milano. Then you remove all the threat from the next main scheme, where you get control of the Milano and try to escape. And then when you remove all the threat from the last main scheme, the third one, then you will uh, have officially escaped the museum. So every single time you defeat him, you can remove threat from the main scheme, you can just thwart it. Um, and you can, uh, there's other ways to remove threat from the main scheme as well, like I think Exhausting Milano and stuff like that. So, he is actually not a very difficult villain in Galaxy's Most Wanted. I'm gonna put him, I'm gonna put him in the B tier still. So, he can be a challenge if you don't have a lot of ways to, uh, mitigate Thwart and to, uh, control the threat. But, because there's so many different ways to, uh, take it out, right, if you have a lot of damage, you just keep knocking the Collector out, making him wounded, and then you can remove threat, uh, whenever he's wounded. Uh, or you can just thwart the main scheme by just doing a basic thwart activation, right? There's a lot of ways to remove that threat. So he's not a super difficult villain. I'm going to probably put him last in the B tier here. Um, but yeah, I mean, he can be hard if you don't have a lot of ways to thwart. Next, we have the Collector 1. So this is Infiltrate the Museum. So this one is definitely harder than the Collector 2. The Collector 1 has a mechanic where he has a collection. And in solo, if he gets five cards in his collection, then uh, you lose a game. If he threats out, you also lose a game. Every single time there is a card uh, that is in play, and then it leaves play, it will go into the collection. So this would mean an ally. There's a card that stays in play, and then when it leaves, it goes into the collection. You have an upgrade or support that gets discarded by caught off guard or, or whatever it uh, means. It will go into the collection. The collector has some encounter cards that make you discard a card that you have in play. So he has ways to get cards into the collection. And um, yeah, I think on solo, this one is kind of known for being a little bit difficult, but I don't think he's super duper hard. I'm gonna put him in the B tier. He's definitely harder than um, Absorb Man. Like these are both in a different tier than Absorb Man. And, uh, but I think Collector 1 is definitely harder than Collector 2, but I don't think he's an A tier villain because he has very, very low hit points. So he's very, very easy to rush down. So I have some gameplay on my channel where I'm playing Peter Parker Spider-Man or Ghost Spider, and I think the games are like six minutes, seven minutes long because you can easily and pretty consistently just rush and gun the collector one down. Um, but if you're not playing him in that type of like rush gun style and you're trying to set up, or if you are uh, playing multiplayer, he could be harder. But this is a ranking for true solo, and he's a pretty easy villain to uh, just rush down in true solo. You just got to know what to do and that you need to rush him down. Next, we have Crossbones. So another Rise of the Red Skull villain. Um, so Crossbones... Let's see, I'm gonna put Crossbones in the B tier. I think that he is, um, I think he's a little bit harder than Collector 2, 
definitely not close to being as hard as the collector one so the thing with crossbones is um the worst thing about crossbones is that he has these weapon attachments because he has a uh, weapons deck and then he'll get the weapons attachments through that deck uh, through a couple of different ways and then he has this one card where he'll activate against you and if there is a weapon attachment attached to him that card will surge as well so that could be totally bad if uh, he activates against you and then during the counter phase he gets a card to activate against you again and then that card surges too uh, because he had these, he, these weapon attachments so as long as you keep his weapon attachments low or you gun him down he's not as hard he's definitely not an a tier type of villain uh, because he is he does have pretty low health and he is pretty easy to gun down and you could just ignore his weapon attachments and try to gun him down but it just gets a little bit risky because of that surging so i think that he is a b tier villain not as hard as the collector one but definitely uh, a little bit more difficult than the collector two next we have drang so Drang is the uh, first scenario in Galaxy's Most Wanted with uh, the Collector 1 and Collector 2. I'm going to put Drang in the C tier, and I'm actually going to put him behind Absorbing Man. I think Drang is a pretty easy villain, and I may move him down to the D tier depending on uh, who else we have in the D tier. But Drang, so Drang is a pretty straightforward scenario. All you got to do is just gun him down. He has this Badoon ship that gains a counters and when there's a spore it will explode and you have to take some indirect damage but it's not that big of a deal because you know when it's going to happen most of the time and it's just indirect so you can have, just have your allies take it. And then uh, the thing that makes Drain really easy is that you, you start with the Milano. So the Milano can help you generate a resource whenever you need it and that is a huge deal to getting a huge start. Um, the worst thing about Drain's probably he has this one like Badoon minion and uh, whenever you get that minion engaged with you if there are no other minions engaged with you it'll do you a face down encounter card which is absolutely terrible because if you get that card during the encounter phase then you are revealing encounter cards and then you have to reveal that encounter card that just got dealt so that's the only tough thing about Drang but yeah I, I don't think he's super duper hard and I forgot to say it at the beginning of this video I am ranking all these villains with their recommended modular sets um, yeah so I'm not going to add any random modular sets and I'm just going to be uh, considering the way that uh, they are recommended to play so yeah, I think Drang is definitely pretty easy because of that Milano there. And uh, you don't have to gun him down, but you can, or you can build up, build out against him. He's pretty easy to defeat uh, either way. Next, we have Ebony Maul. This is the first scenario in uh, the Mad Titan Shadow. So Ebony Maul, oof. Uh, Ebony Maul is actually pretty difficult in my opinion. I'm going to go ahead and put him, I'm going to put him actually first in the B tier. And I'm going to put him above the Collector 1. So Ebony Maul, the reason why I think he's pretty difficult is because all of his spells, so Melvin Maul works around these spells, he gets these spells into play, and they don't activate right away, they have counters. And each time Ebony Maul activates, you remove a counter from all the spells. So it's kind of like a ticking time bomb. The thing is, he has enough hit points to where you can't just rush him down without any spells activating. Uh, because you do get spells to start with you whenever the uh, game begins. And, uh, and the really annoying thing is that all the spells surge so if you get like theoretically five spells in a row you're gonna get five encounter cards that turn i mean yeah it's very low chance of that happening that's never happened to me personally but i mean that would be super detrimental and you really have to prepare yourself to take those spells like i think the fireball one just does four damage to you whenever it activates so that could be rough it's not an attack so you can't chump block or anything like that so uh yeah i think because of those spells he can be very very difficult and you can't just rush him down you have to actually plan for taking the first hit of the spells because uh, he has enough hit points to avoid getting rushed down and um, the spells could really hurt and if you're building out you're going to take a lot of spells and uh, that could really hurt but definitely if you get really lucky and you don't get any spells against him he can be a very easy villain but most of the time uh, he is getting a lot of spells next we have Hela so she is the fourth scenario in the uh, Mad Titan Shadow I think Hela is a pretty epic scenario she's fun to play um, you, so Hela comes in with uh, she has a minion and then uh, she has a side scheme. And you have to defeat the minion to remove threat from the side scheme. When you defeat the minion, then you can remove threat from that side scheme. When you clear out that side scheme, you advance further down uh, hell. And then you have another minion and another side scheme. Defeat that minion, clear out that side scheme, and then you, you advance even further down to hell. And then when you defeat the third and final minion in the third and final side scheme, then you get the uh, captive Odin uh, as an ally. You can free him. Only whenever Odin's freed can you defeat Hela. If you defeat her before then, then she goes into her uh, immortal state or her undead state, I think. And then uh, yeah, she never dies. So you have to free Odin first if you want to defeat Hela. And she gets plus one scheme, plus one attack, and plus three hit points for each side scheme in the victory display. 
So uh, every single time you, de you defeat those side schemes, they go into the victory display, and then she powers up a little bit. So I think that she is not an A tier type of villain. I'm gonna put her, I'm gonna put her in the B tier, and I think, uh, I'm gonna put her. I think I'm gonna put her a little bit more difficult than the collector one. So she's definitely a villain that you cannot rush down. Um, but she's pretty easy to build out against, I think. All you gotta do is really plan around it and not try to gun her down. Uh, yeah, so whenever you're playing her, if you constantly defeat her and flip her over, where she'll flip back over and over again, right? So every single time she is defeated, if Odin is not attached to the main scheme, uh, you win the game. So when I play her, I only defeat her one time. There are benefits to flipping her and defeating her because whenever that happens, uh, she goes to a wounded state where she only has one scheme, one attack. So she's gonna be weaker. And then uh, she also loses all of her attachments. But you're wasting a lot of resources doing all that damage if you're constantly flipping her over. So in true solo, at least, all you got to do is just leave her there, not flip her, build out your board while she, uh, she's relatively weak because there's no side skin in the video display. And then you can just do all her damage and, and just gun her down at, at one time. So I think if you just do it that way, she's a pretty easy villain. But if you don't do that, she can be more difficult. Very similar to the collector one where you just kind of got to know how to uh, face her. So yeah, and I don't think she's as hard as Ebony Maw because Ebony Maw doesn't have any like tricks that you could just uh, game with him. Next we have Juggernaut. So this is a uh, the third villain I believe in Next Evolution. So Juggernaut is awesome. Uh, so Juggernaut, he really fused the magic in type of way where his main scheme has seven threat for the threat threshold in solo, and if he hits all seven threat, he does not win the game. Right? Uh, Juggernaut's not a smart like scheming guy. Whenever he hits those seven threat. Um, what he's going to do is he's just going to uh, attack every single player. So in solo, he's just going to attack you, even if you're in Arch Ego. So that could be really bad because when he attacks you in Arch Ego, you cannot make a basic defense, and that could really hurt. Um, other than that, he just has he's just a brawler, right? He has a bunch of attack, and then uh, you don't want him to scheme because when he schemes out, he'll just attack you again. So he's constantly trying to put the attacking pressure on you, and then he comes in with overkill because of, of his helmet, so you have to spend uh, three resources of the same type to remove his helmet so then he loses the overkill and he also loses the star work so uh, he's very dependent on those resources and uh, try not to take overkill damage so ally blocking is a little bit uh, difficult with him i'm gonna put him he's gonna either be b tier or like an a tier villain um how difficult is juggernaut i think juggernaut juggernaut i think for right now i'm gonna put him in a tier i think he might be he's close to ebony maul but I think he might be in a league above all the B tier villains. And I'm not exactly sure if that's where I'm going to put him um, whenever we end this tier list. But right now, yeah, I think he's pretty difficult because of overkill, right? Uh, chump blocking, like blocking with allies, is probably the strongest tactic to do in the game. And Juggernaut really prevents that because of the overkill. You can just remove the overkill, but if you do that, you got to spend three resources of the same type, which is pretty hefty. And if you do that, especially in the beginning of the game, you're not really doing anything else but your turn. So uh, he could be pretty detrimental, especially on extra mode where he has more attack, right? Four attack stat is pretty high. So I'm putting him in the A tier here. Probably He's probably going to be last in A tier, but, but we'll see where everyone else lines up. Next we have Kang the Conqueror. So Kang is one of those villains. I think a lot of villains um, stay the same in multiplayer in terms of their difficulty. But Kang, in my experience, has been very, very difficult in multiplayer and not as difficult in solo. I think that fits to his theme, right? Because he has all these variants. Who split the uh, player area in multiplayer so he's much more fun in multiplayer and in solo it just feels like a uh, very straightforward matchup so he's not as fun in solo um but i also think he's a little bit easier in solo so other than that he's pretty straightforward he has these obligations which can be annoying so you got flipped down to arch ego but his schemes aren't super crazy so i'm gonna put him uh i'm gonna put him around this area uh let's see i think hella is a little bit more difficult and I think, I think, hmm, this is really hard. I'm going to put Kang behind the Collector 1. I think Collector 1 can be more difficult. And I think Kang is actually pretty straightforward. Um, he could be hard if you get the wrong obligation at the uh, wrong time. But yeah, and then definitely his Mario sets, uh, the Anachronauts can be hard as well. But they're not the worst thing in the world. So I'm going to put Kang right here. I think it's definitely harder than Crossbones, but not as hard as uh, the Collector 1 where you really have to rush down. Can you, I think you can really play him in any way that you want and still do pretty well. Next we have Claw. So Claw is an OG villain from the core set. Um, so 
in uh, in expert mode, he has three scheme and two attack, and then his gimmick is that every single time he acted or he attacks you, he gets an additional boost card. So he gets two boost cards every single time he attacks, but if he schemes, he only gets one boost card. Um, Claw is actually, because his modular set is the, uh, the Masters of Evil, and that's actually a pretty difficult modular set because of the very uh, high HP minion. So Claw, I don't think it's super duper easy. I'm gonna put him, he's definitely harder than the Collector 1, and I actually think he's a little bit harder than Crossbones as well. I feel like Claw is pretty tanky. Is he tanky here? It has 22 hit points, and he gets this, um, the Immortal Claw in Expert Mode. He starts off with that on a second stage, so that gives him plus 10 hit points, so you have to uh, clear out the side scheme. I think he's a little bit harder to rush as well. Yeah, I think I think Claw you're ready to build out against, and with those minions, it could be really, really annoying. So I'm going to put Claw right here. I don't think he's as hard as King, but a little bit more difficult than Crossbones. Okay, next we have Loki. Oh, man. Okay, so Loki is one of my most annoyed uh, villains in the entire game of Marvel Champions. Um, I don't think he's the most difficult, but he's definitely super duper annoying. He's definitely harder than Juggernaut though. So I'm gonna put Loki here in the A tier. So Loki's thing is that he has different variants. And you have to, in solo and in expert, expert mode, you have to defeat three variants of Loki to win the game. Each one has 20 hit points, so it's gonna be 60 hit points, which is a lot. And he has different effects for each variant, right? Like this one cannot take damage while a side scheme is in play, which is very annoying. He has one that has retaliate, which is very annoying. He has some that has three schemes, some that has three attack, and then he has variants that have stalwart as well. So he's constantly flipping between these different variants, which is super duper annoying. He has these side schemes. When you clear a side scheme, he'll change into a different variant. When you defeat a variant, you discard cards from top of the encounter deck until a side scheme is discarded and then review that side scheme. So it's kind of like a never ending loop. Um, I think that he applies a lot of pressure early game, but after you stabilize, his threat threshold is not that high. So after you stabilize, he actually gets pretty easy, and it's just kind of like a long, drawn-out battle because of all the hit points that he has. He's always trying to uh, annoy you and be a trickster. Um, but other than that, I don't think he's the most difficult villain, but he's definitely hard because of that early game thing, so I think he's above Juggernaut, and uh, definitely going to go first in the A tier for right now. Uh, next we have Magneto. Okay, so Magneto is an epic challenge and he is very difficult. I'm gonna, he easily goes first in A tier and I think he's going to keep this spot for the rest of this video. So Magneto to me doesn't go into S tier because S tier villains rank a little bit different, differently, right? They're, they are a different league, a league above all the A tier villains, which are a league above the B tier villains, right? So I think that Magneto kind of doesn't he's more close to loki than he is to anyone else that i'm gonna put in the s tier here and um yeah i don't know where i'm gonna put the other tiers but i already know my s tier villains and you guys probably know them too if you guys uh, follow this channel but yeah so so let's get, get back to magneto here so magneto has this thing uh every time he attacks you you place a magnet counter on the main scheme when there's three or more you just card cards from the counter until you get a magnetic card and you reveal it that can be detrimental, and I think that he is very, very... He gets more difficult in multiplayer because he gets more attack activations. But uh, the easier part of multiplayer is that you can flip down because the scheme, uh, the uh, main scheme threat threshold is a little bit higher, right? Because it's two times player. So, um, or it's two players, so it gets uh, multiplied by two. So there's more uh, leeway to allow the scheme to flip down where he won't get mana counters if he's scheming. But in solo, if you flip down, he'll probably flip wherever the main scheme is because uh, the first main scheme stage is... Uh, five threat, uh, five threat, and then the second one is six, and then the uh, last one is uh, seven. So um, in solo, every single time he schemes, he'll probably go ahead and just flip it unless you can uh, manage the uh, encounter deck or increase the threat threshold of the main scheme. So that makes him loop. That makes him pretty difficult in solo as well, um, and it, it makes it a little bit hard because you have to have him basically attack you in, in, in solo. And then he'll get those mana counters. When he gets three, he gets an extra encounter card, basically. So, uh, yeah, he has very, very annoying encounter cards as well. A very, very difficult challenge. And definitely, like, rightfully uh, as the strongest villain in A tier here. So next we have Magog. So this is in the uh, Mojo Mania scenario pack. Magog is a uh, decently fun villain, right? He has, um, so basically his gimmick is that you're in an arena and you are the challenger. And uh, you have to, every single time you defeat Magog, he doesn't die. Uh, you just get ratings counters. And every single time he deals damage to any friendly character, right? Let me see. It says, uh, after he attacks and damages a character, place two ratings counter, uh, counters on the champion, right? So he's getting his ratings counters. You're getting yours. If he maxes on his ratings counters, then he wins the game. If you max out on your ratings counters, then you win the game. So uh, it, it's just kind of like a uh, fist fight. 
and every single time you uh, knock him out, then uh, he'll get back up, and then you get ratings counters. And if you defeat his uh, minions, and you get ratings counters. If he uh, does damage to any character, right, so including an ally, then he'll get ratings counters. So he can be hard if you uh, are constantly taking damage every single turn, and, and if you have no way to mitigate that damage. I think he could be difficult, but if you plan around that, I don't think he's as hard. So I'm going to go ahead and put him... I'm going to put him... Uh, Behind Collector 1, right, because Collector 1, you also kind of have to plan for it. You have to rush him down. And in Magog, you just got to plan for a way to uh, mitigate some damage, right? If you have absolutely no way to make a damage, then he's going to be super duper uh, difficult. But if you have any other way other than, like, chump block with the ally, right, because if you chump block, the ally takes damage, um, and, and then Magog will still get those range counters. Um, yeah, I think he's a decently difficult villain because the range counters cannot be removed. So if they're placed on, on the, uh, the ratings thing, then you can never take them off. So that can be a little bit annoying, um, or a little bit, not annoying, but punishing. But um, I don't think he's going to be as hard as any of the villains that go before him. Okay, so next we have Avalanche. So this is from Mansion Attack, the fourth scenario in uh, Mutant Genesis. So um, Mansion Attack actually has four villains. It's Avalanche, Pyro, Blob, and Toad. And uh, Avalanche is just one of them here. So Mansion Attack, I think on Expert Mode, I don't think he's super duper easy. I'm gonna put him in the B tier, and I'm gonna put him, I think he's harder than Claw for sure. Um, see, the Brotherhood of Mutants. I, I found them hard to be, I found him to be harder than Kang in Solo. And yeah, I'm gonna put them, I'm putting him right here. I'm putting him behind Magog and above Kang. So this scenario right here, I think, uh, let me try to zoom in. So, each one of the Brotherhood of Mutants minions has like uh, an effect here, right? So Avalanche, after he attacks you, you have to exhaust an ally you control. I think Pyro like uh, discards the top card of your deck and like deals indirect damage. So they all have like this annoying effect, and then uh, which can be annoying. And then the uh, the main schemes, it's kind of random which one you get, but uh, if you lose two of them, then you lose a the game. And depending on which one, it changes the environment in the game, right? So one of them makes it so that every single a character has to retaliate one which can be super duper annoying. Uh, I think one of them uh, gives every ally and minion toughness. So there's just a bunch of different things that you got to keep track of. And uh, it can be very difficult if you get like the one that counters whatever deck that you have, right? Like if you have a deck with a bunch of allies and then, uh, well, that doesn't make sense. Maybe uh, if you have a deck where, I don't know, if you do have a bunch of allies and the avalanche is your first villain and he's exhausting your ally and an ally that you control every single time, that could get really, really annoying. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so I think that this scenario has a lot of moving parts. Uh, and one of the most difficult things about this scenario, in my opinion, is uh, the module set that comes with it, and that's the Mystique module set. So Mystique is like one of my most hated module sets. She, she's very thematic, so I like that thematic, uh, thematic part of it. But, um, I mean, it is, it is very, very uh, annoying because she puts cards into your encounter deck, and it should randomly show up if you draw that card. Um, and she's a pretty tough minion as well. So I think because of that, that definitely puts the uh, the difficulty on mansion attack up a little bit. Okay, so next we have master mode. Uh, so this is, I believe, the third scenario in uh, Mutant Genesis. And master mode is actually not that difficult of a villain. If you see here, he only has, I don't know if you guys can see, but he has 16 hit points on his third stage here, which is not a lot. Um, is it 16? Yeah, I think it's 16. Either way, he's very, very easy to uh, rush down. And the biggest thing that makes this scenario pretty easy is that you have access to the Magneto ally. And Magneto ally, especially in solo, just crushes the Sentinel minions. Um, so I'm going to put Master Mode, especially in solo, I'm putting him as the easiest villain so far in the C tier. And I think he's more difficult in multiplayer, and he, I think he can be very, very difficult if you get unlucky, right? If you get a lot of these really tough, uh, high hit points Sentinel minions, um, with his main scheme, every Sentinel minion has guard, right? So you can't attack Master Mode if you have those minions in play. If you get a bunch of that, then he can be very difficult. And if you are playing him in multiplayer, he'll get more minions out on you, and that can be very difficult as well. But generally, most of the time, especially because of the Magneto ally, he's going to be pretty easy to just rush down super duper easy. Magneto has like three attacks, so he's like swinging for a whole lot every single time, and he has like five hit points. So that Magneto ally kind of changes um, this scenario here. So I think that. Because of that, and because you do have to play with the manual ally, that makes this scenario pretty easy and definitely easier than everyone else. 
and he has he, he just has way too little hit points. Master Mo looks like a tanky guy too, because he's like big, but um, yeah, his hit points are actually pretty low. Okay, so next we have Mr. Sinister, and I love Mr. Sinister. He's a super duper fun villain. Uh, he is the uh, fourth villain in um, Next Evolution. So Sinister, his schemes are actually insane. So they have very, very low threat thresholds. Uh, I believe they're, the first two are going to be five threat threshold. So it hits five, then it flips. And he adds two threat every single turn. So if he just gets one scheme activation, I mean, look at him. In uh, stage three, he has three schemes. So he's going to pop it for sure. He gets these superpower attachments, right? So he gains like flight, telepathy, uh, superhuman strength. Like he gains these things and he gets certain stats because of that, right? Like the psionic trait, he might gain retaliate. He might get plus one scheme or plus one attack. And he's always trying to uh, genetically modify himself, which feels so thematic. Uh, and then one thing that I do like about him is that every single time, uh, let me see, after a status card is placed on him, uh, you place two th three threat on the main scheme. And I think that's a little bit uh, less in uh, stage two and stage one, but that is still cool because he's not stalwart, right? So you can stun and confuse him, but if you put a status card on him, he'll just add three threat to the main scheme. And it sucks whenever he gains toughness. It, some, some of his encounter cards just give him toughness. So not only does he get toughness, but then he'll add three threat to the main scheme. So that can be uh, a little bit brutal because the main scheme threat thresholds are so low. But there are three main schemes. So it's not like he's the uh, most difficult villain. So you have to threat out on all three to lose the game. I think he's around. He's actually he's very so similar to Juggernaut for me. Um, I think I'm leaning to put him a little bit below juggernaut just because i think overkill by the same time mr sinister can get overkill as well if he gets his uh flight superpower um is he an a tier villain is he harder i definitely think yeah I i'm actually gonna keep juggernaut and mr sinister in the a tier and i think that they are a league above ebony maul and hella and all these villains down here um th th they definitely feel that way yeah, I think you definitely have to know how to play against him. They aren't just someone that you can uh, willy-nilly just take down. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not convinced. These two guys, I might drop them down B tier, but I think Juggernaut is going to be a little bit more difficult than Mr. Sinister because he'll always have that overkill, and he just hits uh, so hard. And Mr. Sinister just schemes so hard, so they're kind of like um, polar opposites from each other, but both are difficult in that way so yeah i'm gonna put these guys right here for now I, I might drop them down to the b tier okay so next we have magog or sorry mojo in uh, mojo mania uh so mojo i think mojo is actually a very fun scenario so in solo if he um if he decks out two times then you lose a game so he does kind of put you on a uh on a timer and you do have to kind of like get on a higher tempo and try to gun him down but at the same time you need a lot of threat removal um, he has a thing where after uh, your turn ends, discard top five cards of the encounter deck, place one threat on your hero for each card discarded this way. That does not belong to the Mojo encounter set. And then when you flip forms, then uh, all the threat on your hero, if you flip from hero to Ultra Eagle, it goes onto the main scheme. The main scheme does have a very high threat threshold. I believe it's 25, so that's good. But you need a lot of threat removal to clean up all that threat. And then usually if you have a lot of threat removal, you're playing more of a, of a uh, build style deck but you want to kind of rush mojo down because uh if, if he decks out twice you lose the game and he has uh, ways to deck out with his force response here where you're just card cards from the encounter deck and he's decently tanky so i think mojo is definitely actually a pretty good challenge i'm gonna put him behind loki behind loki and uh above juggernaut uh yeah he's actually a pretty actually is he more difficult than loki um I don't think he's more difficult than Loki, but I mean, I would say it's close just because I, I do feel like the way that he's built, the way that they designed the scenario, it feels very uh, natural, that pacing, where you're like building out, trying to do control the threat, and then gunning him down. I feel like that's a very uh, simple type of pacing, and I feel like they that they intended to be that way, which is why I have a lot of fun with the scenario. And I think Loki is kind of the opposite of that, where the way that he paces is like the opposite way, where it, it just doesn't feel intuitive at all. And uh, But we're not talking about whether I like it or not, right? Right. We're talking about the difficulty. So I think because Mojo kind of caters you in that type of way where you want to be removing the threat, and then uh, you're ready to start gunning him down before he decks out that second time, I think that he, that makes him a little bit easier than, than Loki. But I think he's definitely more challenging than Juggernaut and Mr. Sinister. And Mojo, I think, Mojo definitely goes into the same tier as Manu and Loki. 
while Juggernaut and Mr. Sinister is almost like a B plus tier or A minus. So I'm not sure if I want to keep these guys in A tier, but we're, we'll just see uh, where the other villains rank first. So next we have uh, the Routed Environment here. So this is from uh, Morlock Siege, right? And I use this card here for Morlock Siege, and I use the Hope's Capture for on the run because they both use the same villains. Uh, it's like the one with Arc Light, uh, Chimera, Grey Crow, all those uh, Morlock uh, Marauder uh, villains there. And this is the first scenario in Next Evolution, and uh, on the run right here, Hope's Capture, this is the second scenario. So for Morlock Siege, Morlock Siege is a very, very easy scenario. Even on expert mode, I don't think it's much of a challenge. I think it's actually pretty difficult to lose this scenario. I think this is our first D tier scenario in terms of it's going to be pretty difficult to lose. I feel all you got to do is just get in the battle and you're, you're pretty much almost guaranteed a win. Um, yeah, I mean, I can... Yeah, I mean, the retaliate can be a little bit annoying, but I don't think it affects that much. Um, just because the villains are... Uh, not very tanky, so you can just kind of gun them all down. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put this in the D tier. I, I, I think this is a very easy challenge, actually. Okay, so next we have Green Goblin, and this is Mutagen Formula. So this is one of the first scenario packs in Marvel Champions. I, I think this is actually the first one. So Green Goblin is one of those scenarios where I think that he scales like crazy from um, standard to multiplayer. So in standard, I think Green Goblin is actually one of the easiest scenarios in the game. Possibly even easier than like I don't know, Drang, Routed, or not Routed, um, Morlock Siege or Master Mode. Because in Standard, all you gotta do is start attacking him. He doesn't really have any um, like crazy mechanics or anything like that. And then whenever you flip him to Stage 2, just have enough damage to uh, gun him down. And then he'll never do your extra encounter cards, and then you're like pretty much like in the clear. But in Expert Mode, I think he scales like crazy because you start off with the Stage 2, uh, it says one of you do two face down encounter cards to each player. Stage three is going to be three encounter cards. Um, but when you're playing in expert mode, you start off with two encounter cards right off the bat. He'll do you one more during the encounter phase, so you get three on that first turn. So that is pretty difficult. Um, I'm going to put him... And then you want to gun down stage three as well, because if you don't, then he'll do you three encounter cards. And then three plus one is going to be four, because you know, you're getting encounter card every single phase. So I'm actually going to put Green Goblin... I don't think he's A tier difficulty, but definitely in a B tier. And I mean, if this is standard, he's like, you know, D tier, C tier. But because we're talking about expert here, I think he can be a little bit of a challenge. He's a great challenge to see if your deck can handle the pressure of um, getting a lot of encounter cards and starting in a, a deficit. So he's 100% harder than Claw. Um, the question is, is he harder than Kang and Mansion type? And I, I don't think so, actually. actually I'm going to put him, I have Green Goblin behind Kane the Conqueror. And even though he gives you th those encounter cards, I do have to consider that his recommended modular set is Goblin Gimmicks, which is a very, very easy modular set and is known as being one of the easiest ones in the game. And Green Goblin's encounter cards just aren't that rough. They're pretty easy to deal with. They don't have that uh, many punishing effects. He does have a lot of minions, but most of them are pretty weak. He does have two elite ones, but even then they're not like, they're not elite in like, I think they're not even as uh, crazy as Claw's minions from his uh, Masters of Evil. Um, they could be if you let them stay out for a long time, but yeah, I don't think Green Goblin is is that challenging, but he's definitely more challenging than Claw, just not the hardest, just even though he gives you a lot of encounter cards, because um, each encounter isn't that uh, punishing itself. Okay, so next we have Mysterio. Uh, this is uh, a scenario in Sinister Motives here, and... Uh, Man, Mysterio is one of my most disliked scenarios. I think he's super duper annoying, but I think he's very thematic. So I think they did a great job creating the scenario because he'll put his encounter cards into your player deck. And then uh, whenever you're uh, flipping through your cards or whatever, you get his encounter cards and you have to deal it to yourself as a face down encounter card. So that is uh, super duper annoying. Uh, he's always messing with stuff, trying to like mess with your deck, trying to mess with his encounter deck, all this stuff. So... Uh, where is he in terms of difficulty? I think on standard he's pretty easy, but in, in uh, expert mode, I don't think he's actually one of the easier villains. I'm going to put him in the B tier. And uh, where do I think he goes in a B tier is the question. I think I don't think he's as hard as Green Goblin and Claw. Yeah, I, I think Claw and Green Goblin are definitely a little bit more difficult. 
And Monsieur is, is a villain that you can gun down pretty easily, right? If you want to rush him down. I'm putting him harder than Crossbones, but not as hard as Claw and Green Goblin. The thing with Claw and Green Goblin and all these villains, I feel like most of them, other than the Collector one, you have to really take your time and set up and build your board. And if you don't, um, it's going to be bad. Mysterio, you can kind of halfway build your board and then just start to gun him down. Same with Crossbones. Um, Collector one is a little bit different because you have to gun him down and you can't set up. So that's why he's still a difficult villain. But yeah, I think this is a good spot for Mysterio here. Definitely not one of my favorite scenarios though. And he does do a lot of annoying things like putting cards into your player deck. Okay, so next we have Nebula. Oh man. So Nebula is uh, the fourth scenario in, um, in Galaxy's Most Wanted. And this is my number one most hated scenario in Marvel Champions. So she has this effect right here. The first technique attachment each player reviews each round gains surge. That is super duper annoying. And I think she's very, very difficult. Uh, but then I can't say that. So uh, her hit points here, I believe it says 20, which isn't the most. But um, it, which which is is kind of a lot is what I meant to say. So 20 is, is a decent amount, but she is very easy to gun down and rush down because she doesn't have a lot of way to uh, have guard or like prevent your attacks from going through, right? Like toughness and stuff like that. So she's actually decently easy to gun down. And I have some players in my channel, same as uh, the collector uh, one here, where like, you know, Spider-Man Peter Parker is just killing her in like, you know, eight minutes. I have like Ghost Spider also killing her in like six minutes. So I, I think that she, uh, she's so swingy because of those technique attachments, right? So if she gets a lot of technique attachments, then she's like, S tier. I think she's like the hardest villain in the game, like harder than any other villain like Ronin or, or like whatever. I think Nebula takes the cake if she gets a technique attachment every single turn. They are surging constantly and then piling up those technique attachments, especially in solo, there's just no way to handle them, right? In multiplayer, you can handle them because every single time she activates, right, there's an interrupt here where you can uh, resolve the uh, ability of the technique attachments and then you, you can discard them by doing something, right? So in multiplayer, every single time she activates, she activates more against each player, so you can do that effect twice. But in solo, you can only do that once because you usually only activate one time. So if she builds technique attachments faster than she activates, there's no way to get rid of all the technique attachments and they all have super nasty effects, right? Like retaliate, you can't do more than five damage to her with a single attack, stalwart, like all these super nasty effects. So um, yeah, she scales terribly in a solo. And I do want to say that she's also a huge jump from uh, standard to expert because in standard, every single time she activates, you can discard all technique attachments from her. But on her stage two, this is a stage three card here, but on stage two, you can only remove one per activation. So it really just depends. She's very, very uh, swingy. So I, I'm not going to, even though I said all these tough things, you know what? I am going to put her in the, no, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to put her in the B tier actually. I'm gonna put her first. So I know I said a bunch of tough things, but the thing is, if you're playing her and you get lucky, which I often have, and she does not get any technique attachments in like the first three turns, she's dead in three turns, right? So because of that, I think she's a leap uh, behind all these villains because these villains up here, you need to have a consistent way to defeat them. You need to actually plan around them and uh, you'll see most of their mechanics. For Nebula's mechanic of her techniques, if you see her mechanic a lot, you auto lose. And if you don't see her mechanic, you just auto win, right? So she can be so easy like a D tier level villain, or she can be so hard like an S tier level villain. So she's a little bit hard for me to scale right now. Um, I'm gonna put her first in a B tier. I, I, I don't like her because of that, but um, I don't think she belongs in the same league as like, you know, an Epic, Magneto, Loki, Mojo, Juggernaut, or Mr. Sinister. Um, but that may change. We will kind of rank everyone else and then see where uh, she goes. Okay, so next we have On the Run. So this is the Hope's uh, Captor. This is the attachment that goes on the villain for On the Run. And for On the Run, you're going to get one of the uh, Marauder villains here. So On the Run, man, On the Run is going to go last in the tier behind Morlock Siege. I think it's even easier. You only get one villain. Um, they're not very tanky. And then whenever uh, you, you um, defeat them, then they get Hope's Captor here where they get plus six hit points. In solo, so I mean that's that's not much more hit points. This fully recovered and get plus six more hit points, but they're still very very uh, squishy. So yeah, I mean I think this is a very easy scenario. It's pretty straightforward as well. All you gotta do is just attack them, and then uh, they'll usually just get defeated. So I don't have too much to say about the hopes capture, but you do get a random villain. So if you get one that has, I think it's Great Crow, I believe, is the one that has overkill. 
that could be annoying because overkill is a pretty uh, rough mechanic but um if you don't get him or you get one of the other ones i mean it's pretty straightforward and even if you do get him i don't think you'll have that much trouble this is a pretty easy scenario okay so next we have um project wide awake so this is the uh third no the second scenario in Mut mutant genesis here so it comes with the sentinel minions here and there's or the sentinel villain and then um so project wide awake is pretty fun it's very similar to uh the collector one right here let's get the museum but instead of every single card that leaves play it's only whenever an enemy defeats an ally and that ally leaves play then uh, you put the ally they capture the ally and you put it underneath the uh the scheme and then whenever there's enough uh, allies underneath that project wide awake thing then then you lose the game um i believe in solo it's four i, I don't quite rem remember it's either three four or five so it is pretty low um so if, if they hit that then you do lose every single time he schemes out then he'll grab top card of your deck and put it um and like capture whatever the card that is and then uh he'll get another card so I think this is this can be a difficult challenge. Um, I think hmm, this this is definitely a B tier villain for me. And let's see. You, the thing is, you do have these things where he he has mutants that are already captured, and when you defeat, if you get the side scheme out and you defeat the side scheme, then you can free that mutant and then you get that as an ally uh, for yourself and you can put the ally into play. So that's pretty helpful. Um, but I think I'm gonna put him in the B tier. He's definitely not an A tier type of difficulty. And in the B tier, uh, let's see, Magog, Mansion Attack, Kang. Um, I'm gonna put him right here. I think Mysterio on Expert is a little bit more difficult. No, you know, I I, I think, no, no, wait a minute. Yeah, because Chump Blanky is not really a thing, right? So I, I gotta actually put him up a little bit because I, I do really, so I think chump blocking is the most strong like tactic in Marvel Champions. So any scenario that counters that is already going to be pretty difficult because you're not allowed to chump block. So you can chump block against Project Whiteway, but if you do, you uh, get an ally captured and there's no way to free captured allies that are your own allies in your own uh, deck. So when he gets those up, you do lose the game. I'm going to put him above Magog and I'm not sure if that is correct. But I think that that over, not that overkill, but that that effect you take on your allies means that you do kind of have to rush him down, kind of like high tempo him. But then he has all these side schemes that you want to remove threat from. So I think he is a pretty good challenge and not as hard as the collector one. Um, but yeah, definitely very similar mechanic, but an easier version of the collector one, in my opinion. Okay, so next we have Proxima Midnight. So this is from uh, Tower Defense. And I don't have too much to say about this one. So there's two villains, it's Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight. And this is one of those scenarios where I think it is actually like impossible to lose. And this kind of makes me want to put um, Morlock Siege and uh, On the Run in the C tier. Because I don't know if there's any scenario. I think this is for me the easiest scenario in the game. I feel like you can rush them down and just ignore all the threat. Or you can just build out and then like destroy them. Uh, Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive, uh, they're the second scenario in um, Mad Titan Shadow. And I mean, there is, they're just super straightforward. Uh, there's two villains, they're attacking Avengers Tower. You just gotta defeat them and you win. If they uh, defeat Avengers Tower or defeat you, then, then you lose. But I mean, there's just so much leeway. They're both weak, um, weak villains. Uh, and then counter cards don't really have much punishing effects. So I think that's what really just makes this scenario super duper easy. And in my experience, all you gotta do is just attack them and then uh, th they'll just lose. Okay, so next we have the Red Skull. He is the uh, final villain in uh, the Rise of the Red Skull. I think he is actually a pretty good challenge. Um, do I think? You know, I do think he's an A tier villain. Uh, I think he's. Do I think he's harder? I think Red Skull is actually pretty difficult. I'm gonna put him. Yeah, I, I think he fits this epic type of uh, challenge right here, and I'm gonna put him above Juggernaut, and behind Mojo. So the Red Skull. He has this thing where he gets plus one attack for each side scheme in play, and then he has a side scheme deck, right? So every single um, turn, whenever the villain phase uh, starts, or whatever, you get you flip the top card of the side, side scheme deck and you put it into play, and uh, that can be really annoying because you need to have that third removal. He has three schemes, so he schemes for a lot, and he gets more attack based on the amount of side schemes that are in play. So there's a lot of stuff going on with that. And uh, yeah, I mean, he can be, you really have to control his scenario before you just uh, gun him down because he is tanky enough to where you don't want to rush him. 
and he's a little bit more difficult to control because of all that uh, all those side schemes and he has like the sleeper and stuff like that which is a pretty strong minion so i'm gonna put red skull i think he's more difficult than juggernaut because you have to manage all that threat stuff he has all these different mechanics and uh i don't think he's as hard as, he, as these guys okay next we have rhino so rhino is actually the first villain in the core box and uh, he's one of the most straightforward scenarios uh, in the game. He has no boost effects and four attacks, so he's just kind of a brawler. Um, the thing is, with him, is that his scheme threshold is super duper low, and he only has one main scheme. So if it hits seven, then you just lose the game. So I actually don't think Rhino is one of the easiest villains in the game. I'll put him number one in the C tier, right? He is still easy. But because of that 7 threat threshold, you don't want to be flipping down at all. Because if he schemes one time and he gets an advance, you're almost guaranteed to lose. Um, but if you have an under surveillance, you increase the threat threshold of the main scheme. Or if you have ways to uh, you know, just chump block or like defend um, from his attacks, then you're going to be completely fine. So he's still easy because all you got to do is just defend. But if you want to try to uh, flip down and do some shenanigans, you might just lose from a scheme out with Rhino. So uh, he's something that you got to be a little bit careful of. But if you are careful, I think he's pretty easy. So I'm putting him in the C tier, but first in the C tier here. So next we have uh, Risky Business. So this came with uh, the other Green Goblin one in the uh, in that scenario pack. And Risky Business is definitely a lot easier than uh, the Mutagen Formula. I'm going to put this one... I don't think it's as easy as what a lot of people say, though. Um, you know, but he is... Uh, I'm going to put him... You know what, he is pretty easy. I think I'll put him here. So he's not close to being as easy as tower defense, but you do have to, for him, you really just wanna set up, right? As long as you take your time and set up your board and just build out, then he's super duper easy because you just gotta keep him in his uh, in his human, not his human form, his, his alter ego here, Norman Osborn, while he's doing his business stuff. And as long as you keep him there, he's a pretty easy guy to defeat. If you try to flip him immediately, then uh, he could be very, very hard because then he will uh, actually kill you uh, because whenever you flip him to the other side, he deals you indirect damage. Um, so if you're constantly allowing him to flip back and forth over and over again, he's constantly going to be dealing you indirect damage and that could actually be hard. Uh, so actually, hmm, do I want to put him a little bit more difficult? I, You know what? I actually... I'm going to put him actually... I actually changed my mind because after th evaluating that indirect damage, I think he's kind of difficult i actually struggle with him a little bit more than drang um so this is a solo uh ranking but i me and my wife played in multiplayer and the indirect damage was killing us but at the same time we weren't really setting up as much as we should have um because multiplayer games are just a little bit longer i uh, think is he's so easy if you just set up yeah, I'm gonna put him back. I'm I'm going back and forth on this. So basically, all you gotta do is just don't flip him to Green Goblin. Just take your time, build out your board, and then he's super easy. If you don't do that, he can be very very difficult, and uh, he won't feel easy at all. Um, but if you just do that, I think I think you're gonna be good to go, and I think he's gonna be uh, easier than all these scenarios if you just take the time and set up. Okay, so next we have Ronan the Accuser. Okay, so this is what I was saving S tier for. I think Ronan is. One of the most difficult villains in the game of Marvel Champions, and I don't think a lot of people will uh, dispute that. He's one of the most epic challenges. You have the Milano, but it doesn't even help. It's more detrimental than helpful because of the ship command monitor sets, because you get two encounter cards every single turn no matter what, because there's a permanent hazard icon on the permanent environment, uh, the Kree command ship. So you're getting two encounter cards. You can cancel one with the Milano, but then you still get another one anyways. Um, I mean, the Milano does help. I, I, I like that it can cancel a treasury card. It, it does give you a lot of leeway, but if you get two treasury cards that are the same thing, then it doesn't matter, right? Like if it gets two advances, you cancel one, the other one's in advance, you still lose. So, I mean, he's crazy. He hits so hard. He has ways to get overkill, ways to get piercing. He has boost effects with overkill and piercing. His threat threshold on the, his first main scheme is so low at only seven, and he adds two threat per turn. That is nasty. If he flips to, to the stage two in solo, that's terrible because then you can no longer set up. You have to start to gun him down because you have to do damage to him because if he has a power stone on stage two, you can't remove threat from, from that uh, main scheme. So you have to make sure that you have the power stone and then if he's taking it away from you and you're taking it back, that means you're always doing damage to him to uh, get the power stone back. So he is super duper difficult. He's definitely an, an S tier villain. 
above in a different league and category than every other villain that we've talked about so far. Definitely one of the ultimate challenges in Marvel Champions. Next, we have Sabretooth. So Sabretooth scenario is uh, there's Robert Kelly, the senator uh, Robert Kelly. And basically uh, what he's trying to do is kill Robert Kelly and you have to save Robert Kelly and then protect him. Uh, so after you find Robert Kelly and you save him, you bring him on as an ally. He can't do anything because he's just a useless human guy. And then uh, every single time Sabretooth attacks, if you don't defend the attack, the attack actually goes at Robert Kelly. So you have to make sure that you uh, defend attacks so that Robert Kelly doesn't die. Because if Robert Kelly dies, then you do lose the game. So uh, Sabretooth, I think it's actually pretty difficult because he's not that difficult if you set out your entire board and then get him down. But if you start to do damage every now and then, he can be so hard because every single time he activates, you just card the top card of the encounter deck and, if, uh, and he, he will heal that up by whatever the boost icons are on that card. So that can be super duper annoying. He can just recover so much where you have to do so much damage to defeat him. So he's a B tier villain. I don't think he goes in the, in the uh, A tier. I think he's definitely harder than Project Wide Awake. And I don't think he's as hard as the Collector 1 here. Uh, no, actually, uh, Collector 1's a little bit easier with the rushing thing. I'm gonna put Sabretooth behind Hella. Yeah, I think this is a good spot for Sabretooth here. Um, yeah, a little bit more difficult than Collector 1, but not as difficult as Hella. All right, next we have Sandman. So another awesome Spider-Man villain in Sinister Motives, um, but another villain that I am actually super duper annoyed of because he is milling the encounter deck like crazy. And then uh, he has a force interrupt whenever he attacks you. The attack gains overkill. This, this is stage three. In stage two, the attack is indirect damage, so you still can't chump block against that. So basically, he's blocking against chump blocking um, I think he's actually known for being pretty easy, but my experience with him, at least, I, I feel like he's actually been pretty difficult, um, especially in expert mode. So I'm actually going to put him, I think he's a solid B tier villain for me. And is he, he's, he's definitely harder than Crossbones for me. I think he's actually around Mysterio level. And indirect damage, uh, I'm going to put him above Mysterio because of that chump blocking thing, right? Where... He kind of knows uh, or, or nullifies chump blocking because he's either dealing you indirect damage where you can't have an ally block it or he has overkill in his third and final stage here. So I think that makes him a little bit more difficult. He's not as difficult as Claw because Claw you really have to set up and build your whole entire board against and he has schemes, he has minions, he has everything. Sandman's kind of push you on a timer because he's milling his deck constantly and it feels like you're drowning in sand. But um, yeah, you can go at a pretty high tempo and, and take Sandman down. Next, we have the uh, Sinister Six, the uh, fourth scenario in uh, Sinister Motives. And I love this scenario, one of my favorite scenarios. Um, but it is very, very similar to uh, the Collector 2. And I think it's actually, I think it's easier than Collector 2. So I'm actually put this as the last uh, villain in B tier. And yeah, it's the exact same thing where you have to remove threat from uh, the light at the end to escape from the Sinister Six. Each time you kill one of these Sinister Six, you don't win the game. Uh, you just remove threat from the main scheme every single time you kill one. And after you clear out all the threat, then you win. But I think it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, I could be undervaluing it a little bit, but I haven't had too much trouble with this scenario. It's similar to the Collector one, where as long as you have the threat removal, you should be fine. But if you don't have any threat removal, then it can be very, very tough. But you just got to make sure that you can uh, remove threat. And I think there should be no problem with uh, this scenario. But super duper fun. One of my favorite scenarios in the game. Next we have uh, Spiral. She's the second scenario in uh, Mojo Mania. That scenario pack. And uh, we've already talked about Magog and, um, and uh, Mojo here. So this is Mojo and this is Magog. So Spiral is going to be the second scenario. And the final one that we have not went over yet. Spiral I think is definitely easier than, than Magog. Um, so her thing is she is trying to teleport away and escape and you are trying to corner her. Whenever you do corner her, then uh, you can do damage to her and you can remove that from the main scheme. If she's not cornered, you can't even remove that from the main scheme. But the main scheme has a very high threat threshold. So uh, it's actually fine to just do whatever you need to do and set up. And then whenever you're ready, uh, try to remove that from that side scheme to uh, locate her and then gun her down. So she's actually, in my opinion, pretty easy. Uh, I'm going to put her actually last in a beat I don't think she's in the same league as these super easy guys over here. but um, Or not super easy, but like, you know, decently easy ones. I, I do think that she can be a challenge, especially if you don't have the threat removal. And, and you do need to plan well between her threat removal 
and uh, damaging her because uh, she does have this one thing like her swords which can be super duper nasty you have to spend i think two physical resources to remove one counter on it and uh yeah you gotta remove a bunch of counters to get rid of the sword and a sword would just give her so much attack but you can just chump block against her so i think that's what makes it pretty easy and so she has a high scheme which is very forgiving and uh, you can chump block so that makes it forgiving as well even though she might get high attack with her with her attachments next we have strife so strife is the capstone villain in next evolution and i think that strife is actually pretty easy he or not easy but easy for a capstone villain so i'm gonna put strife in the b tier and i'm gonna put him i'm gonna put him I do, I'm gonna put him right here. I think he's more of a challenge than Kang. He has a lot of annoying stuff, right? So if he gives you like really nasty attachments, it could be really hard because it increases like every cost, every card that you play, like the cost by two or something like that. It might exhaust you, it might cause you to take damage every time he takes damage, right? He has a lot of annoying effects and uh, weird mechanics because he's like manipulating like all this crazy stuff. Um, so he can be a challenge, but he has pretty low hit points, so it's pretty easy to just rush and gun down. So I think because of that ability to rush, and if you don't rush, he's not as hard as the collector, right? If you don't rush the collector one, you're like kind of screwed. But if you don't rush Strife, you can still take him down by setting up. But if you rush him, it's going to be pretty easy as well in a solo. So I think you just kind of got to know what to do with him. I don't think he's as hard as these guys, but I think he's more of a challenge than everyone else behind him. Okay, next we have Taskmaster. So I love Taskmaster. He's super duper fun to play. Um, he has these uh, captive allies, and if you get that main scheme and you clear it off, or that side scheme, I mean, you clear it off, then you get uh, an ally uh, that you can play, like White Tiger or uh, Shang-Chi. So uh, what is... But other than that, he's actually pretty straightforward. He's B tier. It's definitely going to be in a low B tier because his threat threshold on his main scheme is very high, and I believe it's 12. He does some annoying things to you, right? Like if you're flipping uh, constantly, he, I think he hurts you. But is he, yeah, he's actually easier than Spiral for sure. I'm gonna put him last in the B tier. He still can be a challenge, right? Because he's dealing you those encounter cards. But yeah, after a player changes the hero form, they discard top card of the encounter deck and take damage equal to number of boost icons on that card. And then with his main scheme, I think every single turn you have to choose either take in, one indirect or um, put a threat in the main scheme if you're in hero form. So, uh, yeah, he has like a couple of mechanics that can accumulate and be difficult. But other than that, I mean, he has pretty low hit points at 17 as well. So he's pretty easy to gun down. I don't think he's that much of a challenge, but definitely a league above these guys over here. Okay, next we have Thanos, one of my favorite scenarios in Marvel Champions, uh, the epic Thanos. And unfortunately, in Marvel Champions, Thanos is not as strong as his character uh, in the comics. So Thanos in Marvel Champions, is he... He, he is an epic battle. I'm going to put him in the A tier. And um, I actually do think he's harder than Hela. Even though Hela comes after him in the, the Maritime Shadow. But I think he's definitely easier than, easier than Loki. And yeah, he's definitely an epic battle, right? He has the Infinity Gauntlet. And he's constantly flipping these Infinity Stones against you. And uh, they could be very detrimental, right? Like they might tutor a minion out. Uh, or not tutor, but discard cards from the counter until you get a minion. And you get to get that minion and you milled a bunch of cards from the encounter deck. You might get stunned, you might get confused. If you're already starting to confuse and you take damage, um, he might add threat to the main scheme, like with the time stone by milling your deck. So he does have a lot of difficult mechanics. But in my experience, you know what? I'm going to put him above these guys, actually. I think, I think Thanos is not as hard as Mojo, because Mojo kind of pushes on that timer. You got to remove threat. You got to kind of gun him down because if he decks out twice, you lose. But Thanos is super tanky. He's one of the more tanky villains, one of the most tanky villains in Marvel Champions. So he's pretty difficult to rush down. And then uh, he just, it's a slugfest. Like you really have to build out, um, you got to get everything set up. And he has so much attack. He has four attack, but the Infinity Gauntlet is a permanent attachment that gives him plus one attack. So he pretty much has five. Um, yeah, and, and he hits just so hard. Um, yeah, I think he's going to be harder than these guys behind him here. Because these villains, you can end pretty quickly, but Thanos, you really have to spend at least like 30 plus minutes like just gunning him down in solo. Um, yeah, I'm put, I think that's a good spot for Thanos. Okay, we got six more villains left. Uh, next, we have the Hood. Um, so the Hood thing is that he has these modular sets. 
uh, oh, here's seven Mario sets, but then you can choose which ones that you want, I believe, or is, it, it could be random, but you get these Mario sets, and then um, depending on which Mario sets you get and which cards you get, it could be more difficult. He has this uh, ability, uh, Foul Play, where uh, it'll constantly trigger through a lot of his cards, and you discard the top two cards of the encounter deck, and then uh, for each card that is not in the hood, uh, the hood encounter set, you get uh, as an encounter card for yourself. I think in stage two, it's only uh, you only get one encounter card. So there's a max of one, right? It, it says do the first encounter card that's not a hood card to yourself. So you know what the encounter card is, but you still get it. So it's still a bad effect. And on a stage three, you get every single encounter card that's not a hood card uh, dealt to yourself. So it's just a little bit harder. Um, but thing is, he doesn't hit too hard. He has pretty low boost. Um, actually, does he have low? I, I don't know. I, I think that he really depends. I think he's also pretty swingy. Um, depending on like which encounter cards you get and if you get a lot of hood cards with the uh, foul play, right? If the foul play doesn't do you too much stuff, he's pretty easy. Um, but the foul play is doing you like so many encounter cards every single turn and like rough encounter cards, then he could be very, very difficult. So uh, I think because he's kind of swingy, I'm gonna put him, I'm gonna just put him right here, right? He could definitely be harder or be easier depending on uh, the luck that you have when you're facing him. But yeah, I think this is just a good spot for me. He's a little bit hard for me to rank as well, similar to Nebula, just because it could be really hard or, or very easy. Okay, next we have Ultron. So Ultron is the third and final villain in the core box, one of the OG villains here as well. And Ultron's thing is with his Ultron drones. So he's constantly, every single time he, uh, well, in stage two, so you start off in stage two in expert mode. So every single time he attacks you, he gets a drone main, he gets the top of your deck as a face down. He grabs the top card of your deck and you put it engage with you as a minion, a minion engage with you as a drone minion, I mean. And then uh, that minion has one scheme, one attack. I totally like stuttered all over there. But yeah, so Ultron has all these drone minions and he's constantly trying to grab cards uh, from your deck to make them into drone minions. And he just feels swarm with all these drones. So it's very thematic, very fun. And I think he's very difficult because in his stage three here, he uh, cannot take damage while a drone minion is in play. And then each drone minion gets plus one attack, plus one hit point, And he changes up like crazy, right? So in stage two, He's the one that gets an extra attack whenever he's attacking for each drone minion in play. But in his uh, stage three, he didn't, he, no, he no longer gets that attack, but he gives every drone minion more hit points and more attack. So that switch up I find is very, very difficult from stage two to stage three, and he's very tanky and difficult to gun down. So he he's actually an A tier villain in my opinion. I'm gonna put him, I think he's harder than the Red Skull. So I, I don't think he's as hard as Thanos. Um, but I mean, he can be, so Ultron can be one of the hardest villains in the game if you don't have a lot of minion control. But uh, a lot of the minions are pretty weak being just one hit point, one attack, one scheme. But if you don't control them, they'll slowly build up. So depending on what hero you're playing, he could be super easy, right? right? Like if you're playing Rocket, Raccoon, or Thor, he's probably like a C tier villain. Like you can just crush him um, by defeating all of those uh, drones. But if you don't have any minion control, he could be like even harder than Ronin, right? depending on what hero that you play and with what deck you play. So I think this is a good spot for him. I think most of the time he's a little bit easier than Thanos, but it's definitely harder than these guys that come after him. Okay, next we have Venom Goblin. And okay, so Venom Goblin and Ronin are known as the two strongest villains in the game. And I definitely agree. Venom Goblin is my other S tier villain. And he's actually my favorite villain in the game. And I love playing him. I probably played him more than any other villain in the game. In his third stage, he has Retaliate 1, Star Wars Toughness. He has the same uh, mechanic here uh, as the Green Goblin right here that I put in uh, the B tier for villains. And basically what a Venom Goblin does is that when he's reviewed in stage 3, he'd use three face on Conquerors each player. In stage 2, he'd use two face on Conquerors each player. So Venom Goblin is similar to Green Goblin in where I think that there's a huge um, difference between his if you play him in Standard and if you play him in Expert. In standard, he starts off with no encounter cards, and all you gotta do is gun down his uh, last stage, and you don't get any extra encounter cards. In stage three, you start off in a deficit with that two encounter cards, and he'll do you one, so you have three. Uh, and then if you flip into stage three, you have to gun down his 21 hit points here, because if you don't, he is dealing you three face down encounter cards, and you get an extra one, so it's gonna be four, and that could be very, very rough. So because of that, he is an S tier villain, and he has the advanced glider, right? Um, I should talk about Ruin's Fanaticism, but I'll, I'll go into it a little bit right now. So Ronin's worst card is Fanaticism. It's his attachment that has Surge, gives Ronin overkill and piercing and plus one attack. So super nasty. Uh, Venom Goblin has an attachment called the uh, Advanced Glider. 
and that gives every single time Benengam activates the gun shield, he'll act, he'll activate one more time. That, that can only happen once per uh, phase or once per round, I believe. But I mean, giving him extra activation is terrible because he's three main schemes. Each time he activates, he has an effect right here. I should have just stayed zoomed in. Uh, he has an effect reign of terror, and then in his stage two, it's claim the throne where he'll do something and, and trigger the special ability of whatever the uh, active main scheme is, which is terrible, right? Sometimes it's this card, a card from your hand. Sometimes it's add one threat to every scheme in play. And uh, sometimes it is uh, the other main scheme is taking two indirect damage. So every single time he activates, he activates that. And uh, if he's activated multiple times, like with the advanced glider, he's way worse. So Ben Goblin to me is an S tier villain, but for true solo, I actually do not think he's as difficult as Ronin. Ronin the Accuser, uh, to me, is the most difficult villain in true solo because his main scheme is so unforgiving. And I could be biased because I play Venom Goblin a lot, but I feel that his main scheme gives you a lot of leeway because even though there are three, you have to be, be able to remove a lot of threat. But as long as you can remove threat, you have no, there's no problem flipping down because if you flip down, he won't scheme out on you because the threat thresholds are so high. So you have leeway to flip down, use your Alter Ego actions, and gain more power to flip back over into hero form. Versus Ronin, it's very, very difficult to flip down because of that scheme thre threshold being at 7. And if it hits 7, then uh, you may uh, you, you get the main scheme flip over to stage 2. And on that stage 2, it is absolutely terrible because if uh, you can't remove threat from that scheme while Ronin has the Power Stone. So you need to attack him to get the Power Stone back, and then you have to attack and then thwart the main scheme. So... Because of that huge difference there and just the uh, the feeling of not having, of having the pressure from Ronin to not be able to flip down versus Venom Goblin where I don't feel that much pressure and I feel that like I can easily flip down and kind of maneuver my way around him. Uh, I do think Venom Goblin is not as difficult as Ronin. That being said, I do think that Venom Goblin is much more difficult than Ronin in multiplayer. Because in multiplayer, Venom Goblin will get more activations and it doesn't matter if he's scheming or attacking. Whenever he schemes or attacks, He's going to do that thing, the uh, Reign of Terror, where the Force Response is going to activate a special on the main scheme. So it activates so many more times. So in multiplayer, I think Venom is way harder. And I think Ronin is actually easier in multiplayer because getting that extra encounter card with the Hazard Icon is not as bad. Because if you're playing two players, it's just one extra encounter card, three total encounter cards instead of, uh, instead of four, right? But in solo, you're doubling the encounter cards, right? Because you have one encounter card normally. And the hazard icon will give you one more, so it's, it's doubling. So in solo, I think it's way harder. In multiplayer, it's not as much, especially if you're playing like three players, right? Because then you get three encounter cards, only one more, it's not that bad. If you get four encounter cards for four players, one more is not that bad. Um, but in solo, yeah, it doubles it. So Ronin gets easier in multiplayer. Venom Goblin gets harder in multiplayer. So yeah, but this is, is a uh, list for a tier list for true solo. So for True Soul, I do think that Ronan the Accuser is the most difficult villain in Marvel Champions. Next we have Venom. Uh, so he is also, oh, and I forgot to say, Venom Goblin is the capstone villain in Sinister Motives. And uh, Venom is the uh, third villain in uh, Sinister Motives. And Venom is also a pretty good challenge. I think he's either going to go in the A tier here, or I'm going to put him... I'll put him last, actually, in the A tier. Is he harder than all these guys down here? Um, he, ah, no, I, I don't, actually, I don't think he's that hard. You know what, looking back, I, I'm actually going to put him, he, okay, so I'm going to put him actually here. So I think that, you know, I, I was putting him here, but I forgot about the bell tower and the way to really defeat Venom Gob, or Venom, I mean, is so he has his bell tower, and whenever it's ringing, it's very thematic to where uh, every damage that you do to him is increased by one, and every single time he attacks you, he doesn't do any damage. You remove uh, counters from the bell tower instead. So all you gotta do is build a bunch of counters on the bell tower, and then you can you have like so much leeway to not take damage from him and prevent damage from him. The thing that makes him very very hard is that he hits so hard. He gets so many boost cards against you because uh, he has so many effects that give you boost cards, right? Like his one review here, place two uh, face down boost cards on each identity, right? And every single time he attacks you, he uh, gets all those boost cards um, flipped face up uh, against you. So he could hit for so hard, like he can be one of the hardest hitters in the game. But the thing is, with the bell towers, you can mitigate a lot of that damage. So he is a good and fun challenge, but to me, 
Uh, I think he's not one of the most difficult villains in the game because you can kind of game him a little bit with those bell towers. It's making sure that you uh, flip over to its uh, ringing side on the correct time and all that stuff. So I don't think he's super difficult on true solo. But he can be hard if you just go like gung-ho at him and you just ignore the bell tower. Um, even though I've done that with Peter Parker's Spider-Man, I, mean, I think Spider-Man plays Venom really, really well because he has the backflips to uh, avoid damage. But you, if you're playing a different hero, I think he can definitely be um, more of a challenge. If you're if you don't plan around those uh, the chime counters on the bell tower, but if you just consider that factor and just you know play out accordingly, I don't think he's that difficult. But definitely still a good challenge at in the uh, B tier here. So next we have the wrecking crew. So I put bulldozer here. The wrecking crew is uh, one of the earliest uh, scenario packs in the game. It has four villains, right? Bulldozer, the wrecker. Um, I forgot the names of the other ones. Uh, I think it's Thunderball and the fighter one. Is it? It's not Power 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 Driver. Power Driver, I believe. Anyways, so um, yeah, this scenario is pretty straightforward. There are no modular sets in this one. Um, you have four villains. You just gotta take them down. I actually don't think it's the easiest scenario in the game. I don't think it's like tower defense level. Um, see, I'm tempted to put these four in the C tier and have only tower defense in the D tier, but I think it's fine. I'm just going to leave it like this for right now. So yeah, I think, um, hmm. I mean, the thing is, these are very easy as well. Uh, the Wrecking Crew might feel uh, overwhelming, but actually playing out, I think it's actually pretty difficult to lose. So yeah, I mean, this is one of the easiest scenarios in Marvel Champions. There's not really much to say. Um, they all have different effects. There's a lot of different things going on, right? Because they all have different effects. But I mean, you just got to really just gun them all down and then uh, you can just defeat them and they're not going to do too much to you. Uh, yeah, and then the counter cards are pretty light. Like they're not like very nasty counter cards like Ronin or Venom Goblin or anything like that. So just getting a lot of counter cards is also pretty fine in the, the uh, Wrecking Crew scenario. Okay, so lastly, we have Zola. And Zola is the uh, fourth scenario in um, the Rise of the Red Skull. So he is, I think he's actually the only villain in the game that has a permanent retaliate one in all three stages. So uh, you see that Ronin and Venom Goblin have retaliate one on their third stage, but they don't have that on their second stage or their first stages. But Zola has it on every single stage. So um, I, I think because of that, he might be actually pretty difficult on standard as well, in addition to being difficult on expert. The retaliate does get annoying, and even though his hit points aren't super duper high, he's actually fairly difficult to gun down in my experience because... Um, he has so many minions, and the minions, a lot of them have guard, a lot of them have, like, are doing things to you, where if you ignore them, it could be detrimental, because they get he gets minion attachments as well, and he's constantly trying to get you in minions here. Um, yeah, even his, his one review, right? Each player searches the uh, encounter deck and discard pile for a minion and reviews it. So Zola is the, uh, the poster child for mid-tier, like, strong minions, right? If, you're one of, if you want to face a villain or a scenario that has a lot of minions, and they're not super weak minions like Ultron, but you get, you want to get swarmed with like a bunch of like four HP, five HP, like three to five, like decently sized minions. Zola is going to do that to you, and I think that that makes him actually pretty difficult. Um, I think he goes into A tier, and I actually have him. I think he's above the Red Skull, but not as hard as Ultron. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, so this is hard to say, right? This is. This is a little bit hard to rank because like Ultron and Zola uh, and Red Skull, if you stun or confuse them, they're going to be a lot easier than Juggernaut and Sinister, right? Because Juggernaut, he has Stalwart. You got to remove his helmet, spend resources, and then you can stun and confuse him. But then Mr. Sinister, if you stun or confuse him, then he'll add threat on the main scheme. So it's a little bit hard to rank these guys. I, I'm kind of just going with my experience on it. And in my experience, I, I don't really usually play with stun or confuses. I just kind of like take whatever uh, the villain's activation is going to do. So with that kind of in mind, I do think that these guys are a little bit harder than um, Juggernaut and Sinister. And then like Thanos has Stalwart, but he's hard either way. Um, and then all these guys here have ways to get Stalwart or Steady or something like that, uh, which makes these guys way tougher. But even without that Stalwart study, these, these four guys are still the toughest. And I would say specifically these three guys are really, really tough. Loki's tough early on, but then as you uh, stabilize and gain control of the board, he's not going to be as hard anymore. But yeah, Zola, I don't think it's as difficult as Ultron because Ultron swarms so hard and so fast. Zola still swarms, but not as crazy as Ultron. And then uh, he's a lot squishier than Ultron. Like, he doesn't have as, as many hit points as Ultron. 
Uh, but I do think Zola is actually more difficult than Red Skull and everyone else behind him. Um, so yeah, that is it, guys. This is my uh, villain power ranking uh, of every single villain in Marvel Champions ranked in terms of difficulty. And yeah, each tier, uh, like the S tier, A tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, and D tier are all like a different league of its own, right? So I don't think that any villain in the A tier is in the same ranks as like a B tier villain. Um, I may have messed up here with the C tier and D tier. Um, but yeah, and then definitely the, the S tier here, I only have two villains there because I don't think any other villain is in the same class as Ronan and Venom Goblin. And Ronan and Venom Goblin are definitely both in that like same class. I think it can be argued either way which one is stronger. Um, in my experience, Venom Goblin is more difficult in multiplayer and Ronan is more difficult in solo. Um, so yeah, this is my full, uh, was it 2024 uh, solo uh, tier list. Uh, sorry, not solo tier list, villain tier list. For expert mode for solo and this is right before um the age of apocalypse comes out so let me know what you guys think if you agree or disagree with anything on this list um let me know what y'all's toughest villains are and if you also think that ronin's harder than venom goblin or do you think venom goblin's harder because i've i could definitely see it either way this is just my personal experience and um yeah i hope you guys enjoy this video and once again thank you guys so much for 900 subscribers I'm so appreciative, and uh, yeah, I can't wait. We're going to hit a 1,000 super duper soon. Thank you guys so much, and I hope to keep on making awesome content for you guys that you guys uh, like and enjoy.